Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the Presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of James Monroe and the focus is the era of good feelings. The year is 1816, the war with Britain is over, America's at peace in the world, the economy is looking good, and it is an election year. And the country was very much aligned to the leadership that the Democratic Republicans have been giving the country here for the last four presidential terms, so why not stay the course? And in fact, the Virginia dynasty continues as James Monroe is put up for and easily wins the presidency to become the fifth president of the United States. He beats Rufus King. It is not close. In the Electoral College, it's 183 to 34. Monroe wins 16 states. King wins three in the northeastern part of the country. So it's a solid victory for James Monroe, the new president. Now, he's been serving his country in various roles since 1776. He was a teenager, a hero in the Revolutionary War. He became a congressman, a senator, a governor, a diplomat, secretary of state, acting secretary of war. He's done all these jobs. He was fully prepared to be the president of the United States. But this was a little different. Monroe was used to sort of being the junior partner in things, almost a sidekick, helping out other Others who were really the ones in charge. And this is now different. He's in charge. The buck stops with him as the president. Now, he decided to align himself with some pretty, pretty talented people in his cabinet kind of an all-star cast. He brings John Quincy Adams in as his Secretary of State. He moves William Crawford from the Treasury Department over to become Secretary of War. John Calhoun from South Carolina is brought in as Secretary of War. William Wirt, Attorney General. Benjamin Crowninshield as the uh, Secretary of the Navy. These are very accomplished individuals, and Monroe is happy to have them in his cabinet, and he uses them extensively. His model of the cabinet was that they would all come together, debate all topics together, not just within their own swim lanes, and of course Monroe would make the final decision. The challenge was that three of these people really wanted to be President of the United States to ultimately replace Monroe. Crawford, Calhoun, and, and John Quincy Adams all were interested in the big prize, so that would create some tension down the road, but certainly at the start of the administration, no dissent, everybody's in good shape. Speaking of good shape, that's how James Monroe looked at his country in his inaugural address, March 4th of 1817. To whatever object we turn our attention, whether it relates to our foreign or our domestic concerns, we find abundant cause to felicitate ourselves and the excellence of our institutions. During a period fraught with difficulties and marked by very extraordinary events, the United States have flourished beyond example. Their citizens individually have been happy and the nation prosperous. These were good times, and James Monroe didn't want to just sit in Washington, D.C. and think about it. He wanted to get out there and meet the people and enjoy this experience, just like George Washington did as the nation's first president, who took to the road to, to see the people, and Monroe wanted to bring that tradition back. So he goes on a tour, and he starts heading north. He goes into New England, and he, he travels as sort of that plain Republican leader. No pomp and circumstance associated with it, just sort of like the gentleman farmer who's coming along to meet who happens to be the president of the United States. Spends three and a half months of travel, 2,000 miles, about 13 states, travels through 13 states, and it's all good times. Now, Monroe also has some particular interests as well. Military fortifications. In his experience as both Secretary of State and Acting Secretary of War during the War of 1812, he believes that the fortifications for the United States military are inadequate to meet future needs. And one of the focal points in his inaugural address and in this tour was to examine where we could improve these situations, where he could improve those situations for Americans' defense. And sure enough, he finds opportunities and makes that a significant part of his domestic agenda. But most of his agenda on the tour is just meeting people and frankly, noticing how well everyone is getting along, including some people who would typically be his political enemy. Example, in Boston, Monroe meets with John Adams, the former president, former Secretary of State, Timothy Pickering, who he had been at odds with in the past. They had formerly sort of not been on the same page, but no more. Everybody's getting along well, common sentiment kind of across the region during this trip. And the Boston Chronicle and Patriot, a newspaper, wrote, people now meet in the same room who would before scarcely pass the same street. And they move in concert, where before the most jarring discord was the consequence of an accidental encounter. If no other effect is produced by the president's visit, this alone will be an ample remuneration for his journey. The Colombian Sentinel newspaper put it even further. They called it 
an era of good feelings. And that moniker stuck around this early portion of James Monroe presidency. Everyone's getting along, there's no political strife, the economy is flourishing, there's no more foreign captures of American trips, trade is soaring. In fact, Monroe recommended the repeal of all internal taxes. The economy was in such good shape. There's also physical expansion going on. And of course, a lot of this is near and dear to Monroe, who's always had an affinity for the Western area. The, not only when he was in Congress originally in, in the 1780s, and he was looking out for the Western territories, but he helped procure and lead the purchase of Louisiana, those territories. Well, he's happy to welcome five new states into the Union in his first term alone. And they're all over the country. You've got Mississippi, Illinois, Alabama, Maine, and Missouri. The country is thriving, the country is expanding. It's also a period of personal happiness in this first term for James Monroe. It's a family affair. He is, of course, his wife Elizabeth is always by him wherever he travels, and she, she's with him throughout his presidency in the nation's capital. She is ill quite a bit of the time, and so they rely on their daughters, Eliza and Mariah, to actually help out with sort of the duties of the first lady. But they also get to celebrate Mariah's wedding, the first wedding in the executive mansion in American history. March 9th of 1820, she marries a gentleman by the name of Sam Gouverneur. Well, that happens to happen in, in a newly refurbished White House. And they started calling it what, the White House. Remember, the British had burned the Capitol during the War of 1812, including the executive mansion. Well, now it's been rebuilt and they put a whole bunch of white paint on it. And so people started calling it the White House. And that's what it's been called ever since. And Monroe gets a lot of credit for really doing a beautiful job, both on the, not just the outside, but furnishing the, the White House, the executive mansion, a lot of which came out of his own pocket, because that's kind of the way the system worked back then, but he gets a lot of praise for doing a really good job. Now, there were challenges during Monroe's term, first term, to be sure, significant ones. In fact, we'll cover them in a future episode. But in general, the nation was very happy with its president, and he was very happy with it. Late in his first term, he says, at no period of our political existence had we so much cause to felicitate ourselves at the prosperous and happy condition of our country. The abundant fruits of the earth have filled it with plenty. An extensive and profitable commerce has greatly augmented our revenue. Things were looking good, and when it came time for the next election, the country was really satisfied with James Monroe, to the point where it was almost a unanimous election. Monroe won all 24 states. In fact, there was just one faithless elector, a gentleman by the name of William Plumer of New Hampshire, who voted in the Electoral College for John Quincy Adams. Every other vote went to James Monroe. His percentage in the Electoral College, 99.57%. The only one who was ever higher in American history was George Washington, who of course was unanimous. This was a unanimous election, nearly a unanimous election, that captured the spirit of the era of good feelings. The reality, a little more tense and a lot more challenges in the second half of uh, Monroe's first term, but those are stories for another day. For now, that is James Monroe and the era of good feeling. From the life of James Monroe, for more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.